Spring ball is in full swing, and I believe there are three players on Notre Dame's roster whose performance over these next few weeks could dramatically impact Notre Dame's chances at making the college football playoff this season. That's all coming up on this edition of Locked On Irish. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up and welcome to Locked On Irish. It is Tuesday, March 28th, and thank you for joining us here and making this your first listen of the day. As always, this show is available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. So whether you're watching or listening, please take a moment to hit that subscribe button. If you're watching along on YouTube, give this video a thumbs up below. And if you're listening to the podcast, a five-star rating goes a long way. I'm just saying. My name is Tyler Rojek, and I am the host. I'm a Notre Dame alum who's been a diehard fan for my entire life. I'm also a producer for the college football talent at Fox Sports in L.A., In today's episode, I'm going to take a look at the three players on the roster who I believe are the biggest X factors during spring practice. Now, I'm not saying these are the best players on the team or they need to have the best season. Uh, Not really by any means. As a matter of fact, none of these guys have really produced that much at this point in their career. But I think each one could put themselves in a great position to have a breakout season in the fall by having an outstanding spring session. And if one of these guys is able to step up and break out like that, That has the potential alone to dramatically raise the ceiling on their side of the ball. And if all three make the jump, then we'd be cooking with gas. And Notre Dame should have all the pieces it needs to make a run in the college football playoff. So to me, the number one X factor here is Jordan Botello. Botello has the small task of replacing Notre Dame's all-time sack leader, Isaiah Vosky, at the Viper position. So no pressure, Jordan. Um, But seriously, there's... A lot riding on Botello this year. You simply can't compete for a college football playoff if you don't have a great defensive line. I mean, at this point, it's a prerequisite, right? Like, look at the off- or excuse me, look at the defensive lines that Georgia's putting out every single year, that Ohio State's putting out, Alabama. Those are the teams who are in the playoff every single year, and it's no coincidence that they have a great defensive line every single year. And in order to have a great defensive line, you've got to be able to get after the passer. Insert Jordan Botello. Out of all the guys I'm going to mention, Jordan Botello has played the most by far, but it's still not that much. He was actually second on the team in sacks last year behind Foskey with four and a half. But then again, two of those came the bowl game in his first full game, replacing Foskey because Isaiah obviously opted out of the bowl game. So Botello's 79 snaps ranked ninth out of all the defensive linemen last season. So he really wasn't a significant part of the rotation for much of the year. We've seen flashes of Botello's raw talent and ability over the past three years, but he hasn't been able to put it all together on a consistent basis. Um, and if you remember, his first few years were really a roller coaster. He early enrolled as a freshman way back in January of 2020. But like everyone on campus, he went back home in mid-March uh, once a pandemic started. Then when he came back during that summer, uh, it sounded like he wasn't always making the best decisions and found himself in the doghouse a lot. Uh, I think at one point, the coaching staff sent him home to Hawaii so he could get his uh, stuff together. And at the time, it would have been pretty easy to write him off because – Botello was even suspended when he was in high school. Couldn't play in the Army All-American game because he got in a fight. Uh, I believe it was at like a state girls volleyball championship game. Pretty sure he beat the hell out of someone. Had to go to court for it. Uh, I don't remember all the specifics, but it was enough to get suspended from the All-American game. And these types of things started to add up a little bit. So Botello clearly needed a reality check. So he took some time away. He eventually returned to campus and had a come-to-Jesus moment with Mike Elson, Notre Dame's old defensive line coach at the time. And then he slowly started to turn things around. And if you remember, once fall camp rolled around in 2020, Botello was probably one of the most talked about freshmen because of his twitchiness and his raw talent. Now, he didn't play a ton that year as a true freshman, but he was out there on a lot of special teams. He even had that uh, he had that touchdown against South Florida when he just kind of fell on a blocked punt. I think he was like a yard short, but the refs decided not to review it. So either way, he's got a touchdown under his belt. So... Going into 2021, it looked like Patel was poised to make a big step, but then he had that silent suspension to start the year. That was a super weird deal looking back on it because there was that big rumor on the message boards that he was going to be out to start the year. Then Brian Kelly came out and like completely denied all of it, shot it down, and then guess what? 
Jordan Patello didn't see the field for the first three games, but then played in every single game after that. So I'm not really sure what exactly happened there, but clearly something went down and he didn't play in the first three games. So in his first game uh, of action that season, he was a big part of the game plan against Wisconsin that year when the defense switched to a 4-4 going up against the Wisconsin offensive line running attack and lack of a quarterback in Graham Mertz. But we didn't see him nearly as much after that game until other than the Navy game, which again, same thing, they're stacking the box. He's playing out there. They're playing one less defensive back in the field. So going into 2022, he was behind Foskey all year. And then we heard good things about his development and his maturity, but we just didn't really see that come to fruition on the field. Now, to be fair to Botello, not only did he have the rocky start with the doghouse and all that, he was moved around a lot in his career positionally. Um, he's listed as 6'2 and a half, 255 pounds. So with that kind of frame and his skill set, the coaching staff liked to move him around a lot during those first couple of years before, before he found a home at the Viper position. Now, here we are in the spring of 2023. Botello enters his senior year as the clear front runner to start at Viper. He also has two more years of eligibility re- remaining. He's got this year and then one more after that because of the COVID season. So, so far this spring, the early returns have been great. Uh, tight end Holden Stays told Pete Sampson that Botello is by far the toughest guy to go against because he's a dog, as uh, Stays put it. Mitchell Evans even said he was pleased that Stays was able to, quote, survive going against Botello. And, like, if survival is considered a win against a player, I think that tells you what kind of player that dude is. He's talented, he's violent, and he's relentless. Isaiah Foskey had some really positive things to say about Patel at the NFL Combine. One of the reporters there asked him uh, who he thought would be a breakout player in Notre Dame this season, and he immediately said Botello. Here's the quote. He's been ready for a bigger role since pretty much the moment he stepped on campus. He's versatile. He's one of those guys who can stop the run and is a menace to every offensive line he goes against, be aggressive at the point of attack, and just dominate, end quote. I mean, that sounds pretty good coming from Notre Dame's all-time sack leader, right? Now, Botello's in his great spot to showcase his ability because – He's at a position he's comfortable in. He doesn't have anyone playing in front of him right now. And I think it's clear he has the respect of the guys around him. And I don't think anyone is predicting Batello to step in this season and replace Isaiah Foskey's production. That's way too much to ask of any player in their first year as a starter. But he doesn't really have to for Notre Dame to be great. If he can just assert himself during spring practice and become a guy that they can really count on to get after the passer and stop to run when he needs to, then the unit that was kind of a big question mark going into this spring can start to, put, to can start to put some of that to rest. And look, I'm not I was ever really concerned about the interior D line. I think Riley Mills and Howard Cross will do great there. Cross has proven it already. He's a really good football player in there. Mills has all the traits you need. I think he'll be more suited playing in the interior as opposed to strong side defensive end like he was last season. And then you got Javante Jean Baptiste there, who's already done it at Ohio State. Now he's going to be playing a more significant role at Notre Dame this season, but still, he's done it at a high level at a big time program. So I feel like with that starting four, that's a pretty solid group. And like I said, In order to have a great defense in college football, you need a great defensive line. And to me, the missing piece on this Notre Dame defensive line that could elevate the group from good to potentially great is Jordan Botel. I'm optimistic that this spring is when he finally puts it all together and could become one of the great players on the field in the fall. All right, coming up next, find out which player could be the difference between Notre Dame having a really good offensive line to one that could win the Joe Moore Award for the best unit in the entire country. Before we get to that, though, I want to talk about FanDuel. The tournament is heating up, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to points scored in threes made. For my pick tonight, I'm taking the Raptors to cover against the Heat. The Raps are two-and-a-half-point favorites, and I think they'll get it done tonight. Um, I was actually going to do another same game parlay, but I did that yesterday. And then, of course, like all my props for Joel Embiid went out the window when it was announced that he got hurt. I think I, jin- I think I jinxed him. So I'm sorry, Joel. FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss a chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. Here's your reminder to subscribe to the show if you haven't already. Today, we're looking at the top X factors in the Notre Dame roster this spring, and we've talked about the defensive line. Now, let's switch over to the offensive side of the ball and talk about the open guard position. So Marcus Freeman has said time and time again that he wants Notre Dame to be a program driven by their offensive and defensive lines. So it makes sense that we're focusing on the two position groups as the X factors here. But for this segment, we're going to talk about Billy Shrouth specifically. 
I talked about Trouth on last week's episode when I was going over the top position battles on the offense going into spring practice, and he was my pick to start at left guard once the season rolls around. When Notre Dame put out their first five-man unit on the offensive line when the media was in attendance uh, for the first spring practice, Michael Carmody was actually the first left guard in the field, but I don't put too much stock in that, to be honest. Like, you've got a new offensive line coach in Joe Rudolph who's going to prioritize experience during his very first practice ever. Like, that's just how it works. It honestly probably would have sent a weird message to the rest of the group if Rudolph automatically put Shrouth over Carmody in on the first practice, even though those two, Shrouth and Rudolph, I mean, have a prior connection from when Rudolph was recruiting Shrouth to go to Wisconsin when he was the O-line coach there. So let's look at the unit as a whole again. You know what you're getting in the tackles, right? Like, Joe Walt was a first-team All-American last year. Blake Fisher is most likely a future pro at right tackle. And then you've got fifth-year senior Zeke Krell anchoring the middle at center. That's a really, really good place to start for Notre Dame. At right, at right guard, fifth-year uh, Andrew Kristofich is the clubhouse leader to get the start there, and that makes sense. Like, he's been around for a long time. He's got experience. And if Kristofich can produce at the level Josh, did, Josh Lug did last year, which I think he can, then you have two elite offensive linemen, two really good ones, and then one final spot to round out the group. To me, what Notre Dame gets out of that fifth offensive lineman is going to be the difference between having a great offensive line to having the best unit in the entire country. And out of, and out of any of the linemen fighting for that spot, I think it's pretty clear Billy Shrouth has the highest ceiling. Now, Shrouth is still very young. He enrolled early as a freshman last season, but he was dealing with an injury during spring ball and didn't play a snap last season. He wasn't even in the too deep depth chart for the bowl game, so I realized that this would be quite the leap for any player to make. But based on what we've been hearing about Shrouth, I think he's the type of player who can do it. In that episode last week that I was mentioning, I referenced what Howard Cross had to say about Shrouth's game. I'm not going to recite the entire quote again. Um, if you haven't listened to that episode yet, you should go check it out. But Cross raved about Shrouth's game and said he's far and away the most impressive of any of the young offensive linemen. That's not too much of a surprise when you consider Shrouth's recruiting profile. He was a consensus four-star recruit, top 150 player nationally, and he was getting comparisons to Quentin Nelson out of high school. Once he stepped foot on campus, it was clear that this was a guy who was all football all the time, and he was going to make a big impact at the college level. And historically, when you look at some of the best offensive linemen th to come through Notre Dame, the jump between freshman to sophomore year is typically the most significant in terms of development. So let's look at Joe Alt, for example. He went from a fill-in starter as a freshman in 2021 to an All-American as a sophomore last season. Quentin Nelson, he redshirted in 2014, then started 11 games in 2015 on an offensive line unit that was a finalist for the Joe Moore Award. And then he was, went on to get drafted six overall by the Colts in 2018. Ronnie Stanley came in for like a couple of it plays during his freshman season. Then he started all 13 games in 2013. And then he was drafted six overall a few years later in the 2016 NFL draft. Zach Martin, maybe the best offensive line to ever come through Notre Dame, redshirted in 2009 and then started every game in 2010. And he's a surefire future NFL Hall of Famer. Now, I know it's a lot to include Billy Strauss' name in this group with some absolutely legendary players to come through Notre Dame. But my point is that we've seen this type of jump before. We've seen really talented high school offensive linemen come into Notre Dame, redshirt their freshman year, and then take off their sophomore season and never look back. And I believe Shrouth has a potential to do the same. Shrouth has the opportunity to practically lock up that starting guard job this spring. I don't know how the coaching staff wants to do it, if they want to treat this position battle and like carry that over through the summer into fall camp and see how those guys look after summer, uh, summer workouts. That, that's a possibility, but my guess is that's not what they want to happen. As we've said many times in this podcast already, an offensive line needs experience with all five of the same guys in order to really develop into an elite unit. Each player on the line is dependent on the person next to him, and you can't really substitute experience there playing together. Like, you need the reps, and Shrouth hasn't had a ton at all in the starting unit, and especially not with this group. If Shrouth can assert himself as the clear starter at guard going into the summer, then Notre Dame can spend the next four months getting that group of five guys ready to go before the season starts. That'll be huge for Shrouth's development. That'll be huge for the unit as a whole. And then it would allow him to have that opportunity to make the kind of impact that the guys I just mentioned had as a sophomore. And then if that happens, Notre Dame is going to have one of the best offensive lines in the country. There's not a single doubt in my mind that they're capable of it. It's just a matter of what's going to happen with that fifth spot. All right, coming up in segment three, I'll tell you which skill player could unlock the Notre Dame offense in 2023. 
Okay, we talked a lot about the guys in the line of scrimmage, but which skilled player could unlock things for Notre Dame in 2023? To me, the biggest X factor among this group is Tobias Merriweather. And to be honest with you, I almost feel bad for doing this because of all the pressure that was put on Tobias at this point last year when he was literally still a senior in high school. But that was a product of like just how dire things were for the receiving core at Notre Dame last season. And my God, it really was a disaster. I actually felt bad at certain points because of how negative I was talking about that group. And then all of our fears came true in the fall. And fortunately, Chancey Stuckey has really turned things around for this group in just his second season on this staff. And now this unit could potentially be a strength on this team, which was, I mean, it was unthinkable at this point last year. But going into last season, Notre Dame really needed Tobias to step up and be ready to go as a true freshman. He was the only receiver prospect in his class to enroll at Notre Dame after they had to deal with some pretty last-minute decommitments from C.J. Williams, who went to USC, and then Amorian Walker, who went to Michigan. That put all the pressure on Tobias to be ready to go from the moment he stepped on campus, which is a ton to ask of any true freshman, let alone one who didn't even enroll early. Tobias got his first game action in week six against BYU, and he was only on the field for two snaps. He caught his first pass ever the following week against Stanford, that 41-yard touchdown that would end up being his only catch of the season. Tobias really struggled grasping Tommy Reese's playbook, and that was a big reason why it took him so long to get on the field consistently. And then right when it looked like he was going to become a regular contributor for the Clemson game, he suffered a concussion that pretty much ended his season. I'm pretty sure that had to be just a really frustrating year for Tobias. I mean, hearing all the fans clamoring for him to get on the field, but it not really fully clicking in practice, and then to suffer that concussion, a pretty serious concussion, clearly, like that right when he's turned a corner is really unfortunate. So credit to him for having a good mindset going into this season. Uh, but now the pressure is off him, honestly. Like, I think that's a big reason why he's going to excel. Notre Dame has a lot more talented guys in the room than they did last year and a much, much, much better quarterback to get them the ball. Tobias is a long, fast runner. He's probably best going deep. And Notre Dame didn't have a QB who could even really throw a deep ball consistently last season. So that alone is huge for him going into the spring. And based on what the media was able to see in the first couple of spring practices, Tobias was out there with the first few unit. And physically, he looks much more developed than he did when he stepped on campus in the summer of last year. Caleb Smith, the grad transfer for, from Virginia Tech, even said he didn't believe Tobias was a freshman when he first met him. Like, that's how good he looks. Um... Even with the new offensive coordinator, too, a lot of what Tobias learned last year as a freshman will be able to translate into Jared Parker's offense. That alone is critical to his development because he won't have to think as much. He could just go out there and play because he knows where he, to, he knows where to be now. Um, Notre Dame doesn't really have a true number one wide receiver at this point. There's more experienced guys in the roster than Tobias, but I'm not really sure many of them possess the raw ability that he does. He's listed as 6'4", 205 pounds. He's got really long arms and a large catch radius. He was a track star in high school, too. I think he ran a 10.95, 100-meter, so he's got elite top-end speed. But he's also a really smooth route runner for someone his size. And like I said, with Sam Hartman throwing him the ball, and he's got a much better understanding of the offense now, significantly less pressure on him, I think all of this culminates together and puts Tobias in a position where he could have a, like a breakout year in 2023. And if that's the case, like if Tobias can step up and become a true number one, that gives the offense a weapon it hasn't had since Miles Boykin, I think. Um, Chase Claypool, too, in there as well, but he's much physically bigger uh, than Tobias. That's a different skill set. But Boykin was a little bit bigger than Tobias, too, in terms of his weight. But he's really fast, and Tobias might even be the better athlete than Boykin. So we'll see. Like, Notre Dame clearly needs a burner on the outside. They haven't had it in a long time. And even when they did, they didn't always have a quarterback with the arm to take advantage of it. That's just not the case this year. Like Sam Hartman throws one of the best deep balls and back shoulder fades in the country. And that skill set is perfectly suited for Tobias Merriweather. If Tobias can start to take that jump this spring, carry that into the fall, that has to, the potential to be one hell of a one-two punch this season that we haven't seen at Notre Dame in a really long time. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. On the way out, remember to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And give us a follow on Twitter, at Lockdown Irish, on Instagram, at Lockdown Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account, at Tyler Wojak. That's at Tyler, W-O-J-C-I-A-K. For your second listen, check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Basketball, where experts Isaac Shade and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know on and off the court. Plus, hear from big-name experts, coaches, and players throughout the basketball landscape. That's Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Same time, same place tomorrow, guys. We'll see you then.